typical bid budget, but that's just kind of made up, right? You can't compel the federal government to, to uh, pay these taxes. But uh, this gives us an idea of what a voluntary contribution would look like, uh, according to like a good neighbor agreement. These kind of agreements exist with other bids where there's GSA owned property, federal government property in that bid. Um, so it's a fuzzy number, but it's not totally made up. Uh, and if we put all these categories together, we get another really beautiful number, close to a million dollars there at the bottom, the different types of, of category, the different types of property that would be contributing to our hypothetical budget. And what we want to see is obviously a bigger budget so Congress Heights can do more work, maybe work like anti-displacement efforts uh, or, or a home buyers club, things like that, as well as maybe clean and safe. But what you should know and what you probably do know is that some of these numbers are less certain than others. So we can make sense of it on this certainty graph. So the left side of this graph are things that are very certain in our bid budget, and the right side are things that are unlikely or less certain, right? So at the far left, you can see private commercial. This is the bread and butter of bids. It's very clean. They do this all the time. In the middle, I've put those district-owned, privately leased Doppel properties, because even though I think it's very clear that it's on limits, it's never really been done at this magnitude of St. Elizabeth's East. So we'll be a little conservative with that. Uh, I've mentioned the GSA, the St. East West, the federal government property. That's a bit fuzzy. Uh, and then we have a hospital and ESA, two properties. The ESA is the entertainment sports arena, two properties that are very, very valuable for uh, the city's budget, also for a potential bid budget. However, they are currently on a 20-year tax abatement. Uh, that doesn't pre preclude them from doing some kind of voluntary contribution, which I think the case could be made to do that. Um, <laughs> so how do we make sense of this? Um, there's a lot of stuff. So if we start adding up our budget, our hypothetical bid budget uh, from left to right, based on the things that we're certain about, we can see that it's going to take us getting to the federal government's contribution, the GSA, uh, St. East West, to bring us over a $500,000 mark. I think that's, I think half a million dollars is kind of the minimum viable budget for a bid in DC, certainly one of Congress Heights need and size. Um, and even though I've said a couple of times that that GSA number is a little fuzzy, I think it's clear that even if they gave half of what I've estimated here, uh, that, that pushes us into a very, a very doable budget. Um, I think this is one of my last slides. So I'm gonna say that the other thing, that uh, these numbers haven't been totally updated, they've all gone up, but um, these are all based in 2022, right? And the assessed value of these St. Elizabeth properties are going to go up as the projects are completed. They're going to go up a lot. Uh, you know, in 20 years, that hospital and ESA property is going to be assessed at a much higher rate, and it will be bid taxable. Um, and then the properties around these these developing areas are going to increase in value. So it it would be wise to start a uh, a bid early. So my findings are that a bid in Congress Heights is likely financially feasible. A bid or SID, a community improvement district, uh, they, they often mean the same thing. Um, and the reason that that's significant is that it would be a really unique application of, this is probably the most interesting part, other than that this is doable, uh, which is very exciting, that it would be a really unique application of the bid concept, right? So where lots of bids are um, created in areas with already high property values, maybe where gentrification or displacement has already happened, this could be a tool to fund community-driven uh, goals and place improvement efforts using the funds of those who have the most financial stake in the neighborhood already for the benefit of the neighborhood as a whole. Uh, that's not to say anything negative about bids that already exist, but this, I think, would be a novel, at least in D.C. and potentially in the, the U.S. That's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you. Um, Ashish, are you with us? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Perfect. Hi. Uh, am I audible there? Yes. Excellent. We can hear you. Sure. And um, thank you so much for staying up so late. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm kind of in Nepal right now, so it's kind of, uh, it's uh, three in the morning here. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, but yeah, like. And you said you just stepped yeah. out of a party? Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> Ashish, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just. 
just a second. Uh, I can't. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is my screen uh, visible yeah, there? It's visible. It looks great. And we can hear you. So take it away. Sure. Sure. So uh, the topic of my uh, research is uh, beyond the suffering subject, uh, ties, networks, and belonging in the Nepalese uh, diaspora of Qatar. Uh, I pursued this research for my uh, capstone project of my independent certificate in Asian studies uh, that I have now um, completed. And I wrote a paper on this uh, topic based on an ethnographic research that I conducted at my field sites and among my subjects uh, in Qatar or in the city of Doha specifically. Uh, the paper was peer reviewed and internally um, uh, assessed at Georgetown, Qatar, and has been approved by the re review committee. I'll also be soon sending it out for publication uh, forward. So, um, I cannot, I'm not sure if I can. Yeah. So um, in this paper, uh, I have adopted a new lens to uh, understand migrant lives and livelihoods in the Gulf, which sort of uh, goes beyond the conventional uh, media um, and uh, scholarly narratives of exploitation and suffering. Uh, and I approached this by fl fleshing out uh, the social ties, networks, and identities uh, that are generated by migrant diasporas, or the Nepalese migrant diaspora in particular in the Gulf. Uh, the scholarship on migration has uh, enormously focused on the issue of non-citizenship and exclusion of migrants in the uh, national discourse of, um, of these uh, Gulf nations. Uh, the Asian migrants uh, to, who come to the Gulf in specific are, are, are largely low-skilled labor migrants who have come to the region for economic and employment purposes. And uh, the issue of nationality and citizenship are widely discussed, debated, and crit criticized in the literature in, um, uh, in both um, prescriptive and uh, descriptive manners. So uh, my research uh, fits into this by um, sort of dealing with the question of how the networks, social circles, and friendships that are uh, that are formed within these uh, migrant networks in the Gulf are critical to understanding the scope uh, for and uh, limits to. Uh, the efforts at uh, migrant integration or assimilation uh, in, in, into their host societies. So uh, my aim here uh, was to show how the networks, uh, social circles, and friendships that uh, migrants form in the Gulf are critical to understanding sort of this um, this whole um, presence of these migrants in the Gulf, right? So uh, despite their inability to fully integrate into uh, their host society, migrants in the Gulf uh, develop a connection between their host nations uh, using these uh, new no notions of uh, belonging. Um, this belonging, uh, I'd say, uh, cannot be mistaken as a belonging to the country um in in a way that most citizens uh, do what we instead see in the gulf is that migrants uh, uh trace this uh, belonging overseas to the people and the communities around them with whom they interact in their uh, day to day lives and uh, i'm not here to sort of reveal the truth about the social lives or neither am i to judge or rationalize their actions and circumstances um i'm not commenting on the social dynamics um Instead, uh, I'm examining the norms and habits and behaviors that shape everyday lives and um, uh, lives of these people who are at the bottom of the social ladder to trace how these uh, hidden uh, sort of histories of mobility have focused on inner worlds of migrant diasporas and in ways that uh, drawn recent scholarship in Asian diasporas and mobilities uh, as well. So uh, in doing so, um, uh, I came across this um, like wide body of literature where, uh, for instance, uh, Enseng Ho, who was very foundational, whose work was very foundational to my uh, research, was he proposes this idea of studying Asia uh, beyond beyond uh, these discourses of globalization and as an uh, inter-Asian space where uh, mobile and uh, spatial, spatially interactive and uh, expansive societies are uh, formed in the past and the present. And uh, I believe that an inter-Asian outlook uh, describes how 
mobile societies from across the diasporic networks overseas, as well as how inter and intra migrant social dynamics uh, shape diasporic communities. And such an approach, uh, of course, uh, also ameliorates the systematic understanding of the external dimensions of mobile societies formed across the migrant diaspora networks and explains how potentials sort of um, can be seen in uh, like all these uh, diasporas that, are, that, are, that have remained so far hidden. But uh, there's also this uh, issue that uh, goes around on citizenship, right? Like um, as uh, G. Satter has uh, argued that um, citizenship in the Gulf is disempowered for the migrant workers who come to these nations. So uh, for instance, uh, if I talk about the Qatari state itself, this, uh, despite investing in the welfare of its citizens enormously, it, the state is quite reluctant on the expansion of the citizenship, particularly to its migrant populations. And we know that, you know, as I said, that uh, while there's an enormous research that has been conducted for the solace of such migrants, given their um, inferior status in the host societies, less is actually talked about their individual and social lives as uh, migrants living their day-to-day -day life and maintaining their this um, their presence in uh, these societies uh, and like societies which are uh, in the uh, cities and in, in the gulf cities in specific so i've tried to build on the works of uh neha vora and natalie coach who in their article um everyday inclusions rethinking ethnocracy, ethnocracy and kafala uh, have argued uh, that um, scholarship on the migration needs to move beyond these uh, exclusion center narratives and instead focus on uh, Gulf national on the ways in which Gulf nationalisms depict the non-citizen presence and uh, how non-citizens participate in the discourses and uh, practices of nationalism as well as uh, statecraft and um, nation building in ways that uh, totally cannot be reduced to these. Uh, uh, distinct categories of nationality, class, race, and religion. And uh, I also draw upon the prior works of uh, anthropologists like uh, Neha Vora and Ru Gardner, uh, who tackle the key themes of uh, temporariness, belonging, and transnationalism in South Asian mig um, migration to the Gulf cities. So um, in conducting this research uh, for the purpose of collecting my data, um, I used an inductive qualitative approach where I conducted uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews with uh, three Nepalese migrants living in Doha. In my multiple interactions with them, I used to sort of visit their uh, social circles and spend time in these social circles of like all these three migrants uh, uh, for a course of three months conducting uh, informal interviews or uh, discussions. And I delved deep, deeper into how they interact beyond their professional life and how they form their friendships and lead, lead their uh, lives socially. I attended group gatherings and festival celebrations to conduct the field work, uh, drawing on uh, methods of participant observation. And I found uh, all my subjects through snowballing and uh, purposeful sampling from connections and networks uh, of my first subject, whom I fortunately discovered through my personal connections in Qatar. And uh, for the analysis part, um, I most of the analysis since was uh, thematic and in line with ethnographic research. I took an uh, iterative inductive form, uh, like an uh, iterative inductive uh, approach. And in analyzing my field data and in interviews, I identified the emerging themes, critical factors of identity that are uh, salient in the formation of these social groups to uh, explore the nature of intra-ethnic uh, social groupings that are uh, present within uh, like the specific ca uh, category of Nepalese migrant diaspora itself. And uh, in doing so, um, like one of the biggest findings was, uh, which is also the like a primary argument of my paper is that the Asian mig uh, migrant diasporas of the Gulf uh, produce a unique behavior in the region where uh, contrary to dominant views about assimilation and integration of immigrants in exclusionary Western different regimes of uh, citizenship, um, Asian migrants in Doha and other Gulf cities do not assimilate in their host societies or uh, they seek to, or they even seek to do so at all. So by, by participating in the uh, everyday life of the Gulf societies, uh, they form their own social cultural identities and relationships, uh, which totally like sort of um, goes beyond these uh, distinct categories of what, uh, what I just said of uh, assimilation and integration. And um, we know that anthropological studies have largely focused on uh, the suffering of the other populations who have been deemed, uh, I'd say, 
primitive uh, in by the field and migrants have been portrayed in a very um, dehumanized description in the Gulf where analysis of their lives only remains confined to their suffering and exploitation and at the hands of their employers. So there's not much uh, that goes uh, that we know about what goes beyond this uh, suffering subject and what really happens in um, in these societies like uh, what we are do like what how do they spend their daily lives who do, who, who they, do they talk to or how do they form their social relationships so uh, they also sort of trace their belonging back to the communities that uh, from home and then uh, there's a transnational sort of connection that goes on there and uh, both uh, they form their own and uh, comprise of people with similar ethnic ident national identities within uh, these groups. So the ethnic and social cleavages of Nepal from the socialities uh, of, of Nepal have been transferred uh, into his diasporas. And uh, these cleavages sort of have played a very important role uh, in, uh, in the social life of Nepalese migrants in uh, Qatar, where uh, despite being of the same nationality, they choose to relate to people from other nationalities uh, more closely than their own. And then there are multiple factors like, uh, as I said, ethnicity, then um, physical appearance, geographical origin that uh, factor into this uh, social sorting that goes on to even form a small level of friendship that that's happening. So um, in conclusion, uh, um, Nepalese migrants, I would say, are in many ways uh, that uh, Sorry, uh, in, in many ways uh, that uh, Neha Vora would call the quintessential citizens of Qatar. Uh, I have tried to delve uh, into the humanizing element of the lives that these migrants have, uh, migrants live to partake in the identity of Doha as a global city and observing similarities and differences uh, using a comparative method to study social lives of these uh, three migrants. I found that, <laughs> sorry, I found that uh, Migrant ethnic networks uh, and male or homosocial friendships are at the heart of the Nepalese uh, life in Doha. And the Nepalese uh, migrants in Qatar describe their uh, stay in Qatar to be temporary with the hope that they will one day uh, return. Uh, however, they sp spend a significant part of their lives in the Gulf uh, as their uh, tem temporality lies in the social realities and the relationships that they form here, um, making it hard for them to keep, uh, so making it very important for them to keep coming back to the region and then um, engage in this sort of uh, circular migration practice. And um, these are the list of my uh, references that I've used for the uh, purpose of this presentation itself. There are more uh, for the paper. And yeah, that should be the end of my presentation. That's it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Big round of applause. Um, I, I'd like to uh, invite Professor King to, to, to respond. Yep, yeah, please. And Landis, why don't you come up? Much, much smaller. So is that okay? <laughs> um, so super interesting paper. Um, and I'd say uh, the the use of ethnographic kind of approaches to study folks that often are viewed only in labor market terms is, is really important and really interesting. It's something that I don't know the extent to which these kinds of studies are incorporated in planning schools, and they're certainly not incorporated enough in terms of economics studies when we try to understand markets, but this is how people live in these markets, right, and participate. And so it's great to have um, something that's very reality-based uh, with interviews, like that, that's a, that's a great thing. Um, participant observation sort of is is really wonderful, and it's it's a font of and a potential font of, of knowledge that we just don't pay enough attention to. So, <laughs> excuse me. So it's really great to see students doing this kind of work and sharing it with sort of folks sort of in in various backgrounds. And so one of the things that um, was really interesting to me is sort of just the, the assumption of saying that these folks would assimilate um, because sort of based on what I've seen uh, in an awful lot of places, whether it's to the Gulf, uh, where there are loads and loads of South Asians, um, but also in terms of thinking about sort of Filipinos in Hong Kong or um, Filipinos in Israel, uh, you don't see very much assimilation, right? And so from not so much sort of a planning perspective, but from a political perspective in terms of who's 
who becomes part of these countries and who doesn't, and what that means going forward for these countries when they don't have labor supply to depend upon, I think is, is a really important political issue that we need to think about that we don't really think about very often in any of the any of the main lines of study, like the anthropologists don't really do it, political scientists maybe, but they don't really look at the, well, the folks that I work with at least don't tend to look at, at, at these countries and because of the political situations there, it becomes really hard to actually have some of these conversations. And so um, perhaps this is one of the ways that we can start to have these conversations really is, is by having these very specific kind of um, community-based discussions that, sort of can filter in in different ways into some of the studies that are out there. So I'd like to just congratulations and thank you and keep working on it. Um, Chris, can I invite you to yes. comment on <clears throat> um, the Congress Heights? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, very intrigued about the notion of trying to use uh, a mechanism like Business Improvement District um, for the, the purpose you're talking about this, it's funny, we were just uh, discussing this the other day um, in another context in, in one of the classes. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an intriguing idea because it's fundamentally about the notion of that we're gonna create some new wealth here. How do we capture some of it for the benefit of the people who are there? And that's very different than a lot of the actual bids that are set up, um, it, but it's closely related to the question of how you capture value in some kind of um, you know tax increment financing mechanism or something like that. Um, and I say it's very different in that a lot of these are essentially driven by commercial interests um, where the place management was important to them to do business. And over time, they've come to have some benefits in many places to folks you know in the broader community. but um, but that's sort of been you know a secondary, a newer evolving thing. To have one explicitly aimed at how do we benefit the community here, you know, that's uh, if anything a new and emerging idea. Um, part of the challenge that you're getting at is how, in a circumstance like this, you can drive the, you know, how do you capture that value, right? Uh, and one of the things that I think is uh, a question I, I wonder if you've, you've looked at. Um, we tend to, if we're talking about TIF and bid and that sort of thing, we tend to be looking at property tax value and seeing what the activities are raising the value of land, which when we're looking at local government in the United States, mostly, not everywhere, but mostly is about property tax because that's a principal way we fund local government, um, something like 75% of local revenues, although there are important exceptions to that around the country. But, uh, but it's also because the value of land is a pretty good way from an economic standpoint of, of, of capturing the value of what's going to be of the level of activity that it's essentially, you know, it gets capitalized into the land value. So we can see that. Um, so it makes sense. You know, it's, it's essentially a metric as well. Um, but now you have a complication. What happens when you can't necessarily do that because you have all this land that's untaxable? I'm getting to a question here. So <laughs> bear with me. Um, it occurs to me, though, that in a case like the District of Columbia, which is, after all, not simply a municipality, but is effectively a state, too, right, um, that is not entirely about property tax. Uh, there are lots of, you know, they have the full stream that any state would have, um, which usually on the local level, you can't tap into in most places. So you can't say um, in most places, I want to capture some of a piece of the entire stream of revenue which would be income, sales, things like that, and it takes a piece of that. In the district, it would seem to be possible. And I'm wondering if you looked at the activity within the area that's bounded here and thought more broadly about the measures of value and the flows that could maybe be tapped, whether that has some potential and uh, you know whether you thought about looking at that. Again, it gets trickier because the other thing about property tax is in the United States, it's available. You can look at it. You can see property value everywhere in the country for a parcel. You can find out what the tax value is. It's essentially public information. Not in every country, but in the US, that's a peculiarity. Whereas sales tax, for instance, is very hard because it's it's held as proprietary information. And so the state doesn't let it out. So locality has a hard time even figuring out what's sales tax generation. But the district is that source, right? So um, anyway, it's a long-winded question, but basically what I'm asking is, um, have you thought to look at whether there might be other 
revenue flows to tap, but also other ways of looking at the value that will be created and generated over time by the work in, in the Congress Heights area. No, that is a great idea. Um, I should also say that this- but, Yeah, you probably need to come here for more. The answer was no, um, but that's a really great idea. And uh, I should also say that this, I, this idea of using a bid for this, um, you know, perverted purpose, uh, like- Inverted, you, but not Inverted, yeah. Well, perverted to someone probably, like Scrooge McDuck. Um, uh, I think that's a really that th that idea is is not mine. I'm really coming on uh, a long train that's been that's been riding, thinking about how to fund uh, that kind of organizational advocate in Congress Heights. But that's a really interesting idea, the one you thought about. And and honestly, I'm not. Um, I would if there are any economists in the room, that would be really interesting to hear their perspective as well. Um, <clears throat> Because I, I I don't know even beyond what you said like I I would not have thought of um, sales tax uh, getting a piece of that and and I don't know where to where to even begin thinking about the other financial metrics that might be um, less visible. Well, and I, I think that part of the answer to that um, for future research um, would be to uh, try to uh, let me put it this way: if the district government wanted to do this, they would first be looking at. What within that area, for instance, are, you know, where are they, what sales tax are they collecting, right? And they have the data on the flows of that. And you can sometimes get that aggregated even, you know, to protect proprietary information. But they can also look at the income tax flows, right? So the, the district could decide to have a study that's comprehensive of all the revenue sources they get within that area. That's something the government could decide to do and commission somebody or do it internally and produce that, you know, that kind of data. It would be good to get kind of a picture of that to add to what you are doing by looking at property values. And, uh, you know, that I, I think that's a possibility. So. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just make a, a general comment about both of these projects. And that is that uh, I routinely have students come to me and say, gee, if I, if I do something too specific to a specific community, if, if I research a specific community, if I research a specific place, that won't be theoretical enough. Um, and I think both of these projects I, I really love because um, they're so finite and unlock so many big questions about um, either the boundaries of discipline or uh, theories uh, within a discipline. And I think they're, they're both wonderful projects. And um, you know, I wanna thank both of you. Um, and Ashish, if you're still there, uh, a big, big thank you to you. Uh, for joining us live um, from Qatar. Thank you so much. And thank you, Landis, as well. Big round of applause. Um, okay, we're a little bit late, but not too bad. We have one more panel. Um, Suen? Excellent.